the day you start sitting at a coffee shop and writing something on a napkin, well, you are sure you're going to change the world. Statistically, the chance is about one in a thousand. You have to be willing to take that chance. You have to be willing to take that chance. Uh, so when when we built the first virtual assistants back in the mid to late 90s at a company called General Magic, uh, the, the it was very, very hard because we didn't have the AI and the ML that we have today. We didn't have the voice recognition technology as, as, as good as it is today. We didn't have tech to speech as good as it is today. But but the vision was true to today. And that vision uh, is that we uh, we want assistants. Uh, assistance, um, one or more, but also assistance in everything we do um, at work, at home, whatever. However, of course, we really, most of us can't afford to have, you know, people just tagging along and taking care of everything that that, that we want. And in, even in the work environment today, there's sort of less and less of this assistant that handles your calendar or, 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 or other appointments or travel or whatever it is. So the whole idea was you should have a personal assistant and it should cost you you know, under $100 a month rather than thousands of dollars a month, right? Uh, but that has to be very, very human-like, very human interaction. And the more human-like that interaction is, the more we found people would interact with, in our case, her. Her name was Mary. And people called her Mary. And people wanted to marry Mary and date Mary and do all the kinds of things that, that you would do, I guess, when you get close to uh, on even an artificial assistant. Uh, but uh, but we did find that the usage was amazing, and that technology ultimately went on to uh, power General Motors OnStar system, their virtual advisor, and and the tech underlying technology got licensed by Apple for Siri and Google for the Google Assistant and Amazon for Alexa and all of it, sort of everybody leveraged um, that very large patent library to to do this work. But but I think in the future. We will, if we're looking up 10 years from now, all of us are going to have some kind of uh, personal assistant uh, that is virtual, that helps with certain kinds of tasks uh, that we do during the day. Because everything that we're doing in AI, everything all the way from the mid 90s on up is all about improving productivity, our own productivity. We all want to be more productive. And the more productive we are, frankly, the more profitable our companies are, the more money the, the, the companies uh, make, the more money there is to sort of toss around. And if you go back in history since the invention of the wheel, the more productive humans come, the better the overall sort of lifestyle and living becomes. It, it takes time, but it does work. So more productivity is a very good thing. And that's really what this is uh, ultimately all about. So look, businesses today, many businesses around the world, most businesses are undergoing what's called digital transformation. So, so hopefully they've already formed teams, but even if they haven't, we could talk about how to execute a digital transformation. Digital transformation really means to digitize every part of your business, really. I mean, and analyze it and OCR it and whatever you have to do so that it becomes actionable data that you can measure results against. Obviously, many businesses have been doing this. All businesses have been doing it with some data for a long time. But we want to do it with everything, right? With everything. I, if if you run a landscaping business and you have you know 300 people out there mowing lawns, let's say, there's an opportunity to digitize that business and find out what equipment you don't need, what equipment you can reposition, what equipment you can sell, <clears throat> maybe new equipment you should buy. There's all kinds of analysis you can do. Let's just start with that. Uh, but every business wants to get a start, and sometimes they don't know where to start. And you can bring in a uh, what we call, um, and some people bring me in, sort of a part-time CTO. It's a few hours a week to really guide. Look at, look at what data you have. Look at what you have in your business. Look at what's taking the time. Actually measure how much time is spent on marketing. How much time is spent answering the phones. How good are those phone answerers, right? Are they giving really, really great advice? Are they are they closing people in terms of sales, right? Are they helping with customer support? All of those things could be massively improved depending on how much labor is being spent um, and probably, you know, drive up business results and drive down um, costs. So you get these sort of fractional CTOs that will uh, that will help. And, uh, and, and they become a little member of your team for an hour or two a week just focused on how do I transform this business from where it is today to one or two years from now, 
highly digital, leveraging AI and machine learning, leveraging the best, the best of all technologies, right? Not just that cloud, um, IoT, uh, all of those are, 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 are valuable. And in fact, the intersection, real digital transformation is the intersection of IoT, that's Internet of Things, so that's devices monitoring things. So IoT and cloud and AI. And when you put those three together, that's your game changer. <laughs> Innovation isn't obviously limited to Silicon Valley, but Silicon Valley clearly has uh, has taken a lead since the 1970s in innovating around technology more than any other area. And that's, again, not to take anything away from any other locale. But everybody, I mean, you know, groups of people keep coming to Silicon Valley from all over the world to learn about Silicon Valley. Um, so what makes Silicon Valley unique? Well, there's a lot of things that make it unique. Obviously, the plethora of engineering talent and and um, the, 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 the amazing schools that generate engineering talent and uh, an immense uh, venture capital network that can invest you know, tens of billions a year into the, into the ecosystem here. <clears throat> but one of the things that is different is, um, is the willingness to take risk. And that's what disruptive innovation is about. You cannot disruptively innovate your industry or other industries without taking some risks. And so the rule of thumb in Silicon Valley is when you start a company uh, on a napkin, usually on a napkin with a friend, and you get a little bit of, you know, friends and family money, 100K, 200K, whatever it is, um, your chance of success is some number at that point, like, you know, one in a thousand. It's very low. And then you finally go out and get a little bit of real money, maybe a several hundred K from angels. And now your chance of success is one in a hundred. And finally, you get venture money, meaning five million or more, let's say. And now your chance of success is about one in 10. So the day you start sitting at a coffee shop and writing something on a napkin, well, you are sure you're going to change the world. Statistically, the chance is about one in a thousand. You have to be willing to take that chance. You have to be willing to take that chance. Now, how does a business learn from that, right? Because a business can't take a thousand chances. But what you can do is you can build these innovation teams and uh, there's an entire culture and I teach this in, 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 in my keynotes when people want to learn about disruptive innovation and disruptive innovation comes from the top. And the number one, job one, is to not make anyone feel stupid for their idea because no one takes risks when they feel vulnerable, vulnerable in the job, vulnerable to be laughed at. So let's say you're a company that is in the landscaping business and you're sitting around a table about really disrupting the in industry or just being highly innovative and doubling the size of the company in five years, whatever it is. And someone says, I, I think we should uh, make chairs, make chairs. Yeah. You know, we know a lot of us know a lot of woodworking and we should make and sell chairs. Everyone. I know what you're going to say when you're listening to this, you're going to say, Oh, we're going to laugh at that. No idea can be laughed at and no idea can be a bad idea and no one can be judged by it or else you won't get the best ideas out of people. So you have got to have that disruptive innovation sort of culture from the top. The innovation culture is really about making sure that no one feels vulnerable. So we've got to get vulnerability off the table. I want everyone to say everything. Look, the best ideas will ultimately germinate to the top. And, and when you execute those, the trick is execute many and kill them fast. Okay, so... It might be 10 things get executed and get some money. But within weeks, you're going to see that some really have a chance to fly and some probably don't have a good market fit or don't have a good, maybe it's manufacturing fit for you or whatever it is. So those are the two big things. There's a whole list of 10 that, that I give in my talks and, I, and you know people have takeaways to go execute disruptive innovation, Silicon Valley disruptive innovation in their companies uh, in, a, in a safe way um, that will accelerate that company in ways that you could have never done, probably without coming to see me. So look, AI is it can be a complex topic, and what I try to do is put it into very, very, very simple topics, simple words, simple ways, so that when people leave from the audience, they go, oh, that's just math. Oh, and now I understand what it works, so that when we say... You know, a neural network. What is a neural net? Well, how does that work? And I can show them very simply in five minutes and they'll walk out and go, well, I wouldn't want to build it. I wouldn't want to do it myself. But now when someone tells me 
oh, well, I'm going to use a neural net to do this, or I'm, it's AI, or it's ML, or it's supervised, or it's unsupervised, or it's reinforcement, they will know what those terms are, and they will go, I got it. It's not a mystery, right? So there's two parts of AI that people have to understand. There is the creation of algorithms, and, and <laughs> that is meant for deep mathematical scientists, basically, right? Scientists and coders, and and that is strictly math. You know, everything that you're seeing in AI is really these are math models and probability models and statistical models and things like that. Very complex, right? So that's the first thing, um, and we want to teach a little bit of that, but just enough so that people aren't afraid of it anymore. Because I find that people can be very, very afraid of these things. And then the other side is applied AI, is to take that amazing math and amazing models that have come out of that and apply it. What, what we want to do is apply it to something, right? And that's where all the fun is, and that's actually where all the wins are, right? I've got to apply this thing called generative AI. I need to apply it to an actual field and get some value out of it. And we teach you how to do that and how to think about all of the things you do in your business and where might I apply this? And then what vendors are there that can help me? There's startups, there's bigger companies, all kinds of things, right? So we just want to make it easy for everyone uh, so that when they walk in the room, they're probably scared of it. When they walk out, they're not scared. They're ready to embrace and they're excited about it. And, um, and I've been doing this for, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years or something. So, so we've been talking about AI that long and I've been teaching people, uh, just enough so that they're no longer scared and it works really well.